Well, I have indeed uh, given hundreds, maybe thousands of talks, and John, that was the most unusual introduction of my life. Uh, but indeed, I thank you. Uh, what I want to do tonight is take you back more than 150 years. We'll start out from an aeronautics point of view. You know, in the, in the balloons, even though by that time had been used, known about for more than 50 years, their real use and utility was still not well understood. These men, these aeronauts that used balloons early on, were, were really the barnstormers. They were showmen. They were, they were uh, those that took rides across the country and blew, that blew in the wind. And so they were, they were really pioneers from that perspective. So just before the Civil War, what were they thinking? What were they doing? And in a convention that occurred in May 1857, a series of them got together and they decided, we need to cross the Atlantic. <laughs> All right? And this is an unbelievable step forward. But many of them had been in the air. This one in particular, Thaddeus Lowe, who'd been a more recent aeronaut, only had flown a few times in the late 50s, got wrapped up into the, in the, into the fever of, of doing trans-Atlantic uh, uh, ballooning. Now, why was that important? Well, they realized uh, from a ballooning perspective that a lot of the air currents went from west to east. And this is not the electrojet everyone hears about from, plane, from a plane altitude. But there's a lot of layers in the atmosphere where the winds blow one way or will blow the other way. But the prevailing winds are west to east. And so the idea is if you can get a big enough uh, uh, filled sphere, uh, you, can, you can potentially make it across uh, the Atlantic in, in, in a matter of days where typically it took more than a month to cross it in the fastest ships that are available. So this meant you could bring news, you could bring uh, all sorts of um, uh, business uh, interests, and many businessmen would invest in ventures like this. Now right at the same time, they laid the first transatlantic telegraph cable, and it only worked for a few days. And uh, um, the, uh, the, the cost of that was uh, uh, millions of dollars. And so uh, the balloonists felt, well, now it's our turn. Now let's get going. And we can do this. So Lowe put together a series of investors. Uh, and here's his big balloon across the Atlantic. It's called the City of New York. And his investors, of course, meant, were from New York. They were going to fund this balloon. He built it. It is a 725,000 cubic feet balloon, which is absolutely enormous. It's more than 25 times some of the biggest traditional balloons that the balloonists had. A huge gondola and a boat needed that. If, if something happened and you had to go down, you, you, could finish, you could finish that last little bit on a boat. So this was really invented, and he got the, he got the backers. He really put this together, and uh, he made several attempts. He had a couple seasons in, in 1859 and 1860 to get it filled and give it a try, and uh, it largely was a flop. He had a number of problems with that. In fact, he moved it late in the season from New York to Philadelphia, where he got more backers uh, and renamed it the uh, Great Western, because there was a, a fabulous um, uh, maybe Great Eastern, because there was a fabulous uh, boat that uh, the British were building called the Great Western. So he was, uh, he was, he was trying to uh, get wrapped up in this communication activity. Um, one of his friends uh, that uh, uh, he corresponded with was Joseph Henry. Joseph Henry is the first secretary of the Smithsonian. Uh, the Smithsonian at this time had only been in existence maybe a dozen years. And um, uh, uh, Joseph Henry was really big in, in meteorology. So he wanted to know what the weather was like. And so the aeronauts, which were telling him about the prevailing winds, 
you got the idea, well, we install telegraphs everywhere and we got weather reports from the west of us that would tell us what the weather would be like tomorrow. You know, so he began uh, doing some of the first weather predictions. So that's Joseph Henry. Joseph Henry thought that this was an interesting idea, not sure it was gonna work, but before you bet all and fly across the Atlantic, you really needed to do a test. And so Lowe decided, yes, I'll do a cross-country test. Okay, and then 1861 came, and in April 1861, Fort Sumner, surrounded in, in um, um, uh, by the Confederacy, was fired on. 36 hours later, it was pretty well destroyed, and the men surrendered. Now, why this occurred, where uh, Lincoln was elected, uh, he was going to show up in uh, Washington, D.C. on March 4th. Prior to that, many of the states were seceding like crazy. There was like seven states that seceded. There were a series of states that hadn't seceded yet. Virginia was one of them. North Carolina was one of them. Tennessee was one of those. Big populous states. You really tried to keep those states in the Union. But this small garrison, Charleston Bay, was running out of supplies and he made the decision to supply it with a boat of, uh, that uh, had no arms, no new men. He notified uh, the Confederacy at that time, that's what he was gonna do. And um, uh, as the supply ship was, uh, was making its way there, the Confederacy wanted that property, felt it was theirs, and, and, and the war started with, this, uh, with the bombardment. Now Lincoln took that as indeed them start the, Confe the Confederacy starting the rebellion. And so um, he then, the next day, April 17th, after this 36 hour bombardment, called for 75,000 troops. The very next day, Virginia seceded. Now it's a war. Not too long after that, North Carolina, not too long after that, Arkansas, not too long after that, uh, Tennessee. And so in April, the tensions were high. All kinds of things were going on. The war was, was really building. Sentiments were high. And Thaddeus Lowe launches its balloon from Cincinnati to Washington, D.C to do his test. Okay, well the winds, although they prevailed from west to east, blew him off course. And uh, on the 20th of April, many days after uh, Fort Sumner, he left at four in the morning. He waited that till the, the newspaper, the Cincinnati Daily came out, took a bunch of copies with him, in his gondola, off he went, uh, and in nine hours later, he was in Unionville, South Carolina. <laughs> All right, and when he landed, uh, all hell broke loose, if I may say it that way. He was uh, thought a spy. Here he had all this northern material, in a newspaper from Cincinnati, and uh, they they took him to jail. And what saved him? were a number of businessmen who actually were well-educated and knew a lot about learning, followed this science, and understood that he really was in the process of doing some tests and, and not really a spy for the, for the Union Army. Well, this, this game you should have hired the guy. I don't know. <laughs> let him go. <laughs> well, they let him go. They let him go. That was our biggest mistake. But he learned one important thing. He learned one important thing that if he ever was caught in the Confederacy again, he would be shot as a spy, <coughs> all right? Now Lowe, all throughout his war experience, continues to learn all these interesting things about operating the balloons and improving them all the time. And so this is one lesson he learned the hard way. And uh, indeed, uh, he then went back to Philadelphia where he was from not too long after that, Joseph Henry contacted him and said, Abraham Lincoln would like to see you. Come down to Washington, D.C. A number of businessmen in the area were also promoting that, writing letters to Secretary Chase and, 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 and other uh, parts of the government. 
Uh, the newspapers throughout the area were talking about the importance that balloons could bring uh, to, uh, to the military. And so uh, Lincoln had read Lowe's, about Lowe's uh, adventure and was quite interested in talking to Thaddeus Lowe. So on June 11, uh, Lowe had come down from Philadelphia and uh, uh, had visited Henry, and Henry took him over to see Abraham Lincoln. Now this was a rather critical meeting for both gentlemen. It was critical because uh, Henry really didn't know Lincoln very well. He might have met him once or twice prior to that. Uh, uh, Lincoln, of course, fancied himself as, a, as a, an inventor, uh, interested in, in new technologies, interested in science. And so they had a natural, uh, a natural ability to um, uh, talk about these things and, and how science could be used in the war. And so the introduction by Henry of Lowe to Lincoln was critical in having Lincoln think about how this could be part of his overall strategy. Now, what was Lincoln thinking at the time? And, and we can only um, uh, project uh, our analysis of that. But here was his situation, uh, surrounded almost by the Confederacy. Significant part of Maryland uh, wanted to uh, leave the Union. Uh, Lincoln had uh, uh, sent troops via uh, Baltimore. He was desperate for supplies coming in and out, up and down the Potomac from the south, going uh, uh, with Virginia on one side, Maryland on the other. Uh, he, he felt that Washington, D.C. was very vulnerable, very vulnerable. And so his strategy was indeed to uh, uh, take uh, Arlington, get over into uh, Virginia, uh, build some forts. In fact, they cut down uh, the forts all around that area so that they had a clean set of observations. But that still wasn't enough. He was still very worried about large forces uh, coming into uh, the D.C. area. So Lowe proposed several experiments. He said, don't take my word for it. Let me show you what we can do. And so uh, uh, Joseph Henry bankrolled him, gave him 250 bucks, and that is what came up with, which was a lot of money at that time, came up with this fabulous idea. He took the Enterprise with him. Now here is Washington, D.C. Mall area, 1861. The CNO Canal ran through it. Comes down and goes uh, uh, actually uh, um, uh, out um, closer to the Navy Yard. And what's sitting on the mall, not only is the Smithsonian Institution, the castle, but you can also see in the circle the gas works. This is the city gas works. This is where they would create carbonated hydrogen by burning peat and coal and then pump that through the gas lines. And so when you walk in your building, you turn on your gas lamp and lit it, and that was your light. That was your light. So the gas works fed the lights of the city, but the gas works, uh, the carbonated hydrogen was still lighter than air. And you could fill a balloon with that, and you could launch a balloon uh, to uh, uh, fairly great heights. So uh, Lowe stayed at the National Hotel, that's the other circle, came across Brody's Balloon uh, Enterprise, and with the money he got from Joseph Henry, he hired about 30 servicemen, and they came over uh, to support the filling of the balloon and holding down the, the, the balloon uh, guide ropes as Lowe would, would ascend on the mall. And so uh, the gas works right now is at the uh, location, so here's a modern view, the gas works right now is at the location of the modern uh, American Indian Museum, the brand new one. And at the end of the Smithsonian is a place called uh, the DC Armory. Uh, and that's, uh, that's right here, here's the DC Armory. And Lowe would be based out of the DC Armory. It was big rooms, he could lay out balloons, he could, he could fix them, he could do the things that he needed to. So, so Lowe had a great setup. So what was he going to do to convince Lincoln the balloons were great? This. He launched his balloon from the mall, a tethered balloon. He took with him 
a telegraph operator and the telegraph operator's boss, who absolutely had to be part of this, couldn't, couldn't, and it needed to be part of history. They went up 500 feet, 500 feet tethered, and Lincoln described the sights he saw and sent a telegram to Lincoln. Okay? Now, that had never been done before. Now, last year, the 150th anniversary of this event, uh, the Air and Space Museum uh, really supported a gala event. Uh, we actually, uh, uh, Tom Crouch and the group uh, had a commemorative plaque that was put on the grounds of the Air and Space Museum where Lincoln, or where Lowe uh, launched his balloon. And so here's the setup. Now we couldn't get anything above the mall at 500 feet, but a couple blocks away, we could launch a small camera on a balloon. They would let us do that. And so this is the view from that camera in June of last year, the 150th anniversary. So uh, here is pretty much the view Thaddeus Lowe had. It's right at 500 feet. It's looking out into Virginia. Uh, it was a beautiful day, although it looks smoggy. Okay. Um, uh, here's the actual telegram that uh, uh, Lowe sent Lincoln. The White House is right there. And so Lincoln, although we don't know this for a fact, actually could have walked out on the lawn or on the veranda, looked up, and could have seen Lowe. But Lincoln does receive this telegram. Now here's what the telegram states. It says, um, uh, to the President of the United States. Let me just read it and then I can look this way. Uh, this point of observation commands an area nearly 50 miles in diameter. The city with its girdle of encampments presents a superb scene. I have the pleasure in sending you this first dispatch ever telegraph from an aerial station and in acknowledging indebtedness to your encouragement for the opportunity of demonstrating the availability of the science of aeronautics and military service of the country, Thaddeus Lowe. Now that was, uh, that, was, that was unbelievable. It hit every major newspaper in the country and most of the Confederate ones too. So uh, Lowe really became known uh, for this activity. But this is very characteristic of Lowe. He's quite the showman. But more importantly, he's quite the engineer. And he is tops in this field. He's really an outstanding engineer. Lincoln gets the telegram. I gotta talk to I gotta talk to Lowe. So he brings Lowe over to the White House. This is a period picture of uh, the White House, 1861. And they spend the evening together. And uh, as they uh, spend the evening together, they talk about what ballooning uh, could do, uh, uh, what the ballooning could do for the military. And Lowe has enormous number of ideas. And so um, let me read to you Lowe's personal account of that meeting with Lincoln. The president was intensely interested in my outline of the proposed aeronautics corps, and after the departure of his secretaries and assistants, we discussed the possibilities of the service and the details of the operation. He was especially interested in my plan for directing the fire of artillery on the enemy that the gunners themselves could not see. We talked till late into the night and then retired. He wearied from the cares of the state, and I almost too excited to sleep. So enthused was I at the prospect of being directed to form a new branch of the military service. Now in the morning, he has breakfast with Lincoln. They, you know, Lincoln had an opportunity to think about it overnight. And after breakfast, breakfast the following morning, the president directed his secretary to give me a letter of introduction to Lieutenant General Scott stating the objective of my visit and that the plans proposed had the president's endorsement. Well, Scott, Scott is, uh, is really a tremendous uh, uh, military figure in the United States. He's in his 70s, uh, uh, by many thought, well past his prime. 
but still extremely sharp in thinking about how to win the war. Uh, and, and at that time, he's very traditionalist. He was in the War of 1812, and he did a fabulous job in the uh, Mexican-American War in the 1840s. And so he's thinking of traditional uh, sets of activities, and as Lowe tries to get in to see General Scott, it wasn't working. He wouldn't see him. But in the meantime, the topographical engineers, who also read the newspaper, also realized that from a balloon you can sketch the roads and the map and create maps were of an, an, an estimable uh, uh, importance to them. And so they began to task Thaddeus Lowe to do just that. And so Lowe would fill up the Enterprise uh, when, it was, uh, uh, when, when the gas was uh, depleted. And his balloons, he could use the gas. He had, he had created a, um, a varnish on his balloons where the gas would last several weeks, two to three weeks at a shop. So once he had it filled, it was, it was great. Multiple observations, day or night, didn't matter. So all he had to do was fill it at the gas works, cross Long Bridge, uh, and go down to um, uh, Fort Runyon or up to Arlington, or go on up to um, the Aqueduct Bridge, and then go over to Fort Corcoran, uh, and then uh, uh, make a variety of observations. And so this, was the, this was, is indeed what Lowe did and he became really well known for this. The papers were going crazy. You can't pick up uh, Philadelphia Inquirer or the New York Herald or the New York Times or the Washington Star for any of these days and not find something about the balloon, that, that the balloon observations that Lowe was, was, was doing. They just thronged after him because when he came down, he just told them what they saw. Now, today, military, military intelligence like that wouldn't be in the newspaper, but they, they just did that, you know? You would be happy to tell them, well, here's what I saw. This is where they're going. We got a big force of Confederates at, at Fairfax Courthouse, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and that ended up in the paper soon. Now, this is um, uh, 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 a record. Uh, this is a, a sketch by... Um, uh, Harrison Jeffries of the 20th Michigan. This is a, 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 out of the National Archives, out of the pension records. Here's the sketch of Fort Woodbury. That's where he was in. Fort Corcoran's over to the side here. And there's Thaddeus Lowe's balloon off to your far right. And so uh, the balloons were noted by everybody. Once they got in, once Lowe got in the air, he also took a variety of men with him. Now, the Confederates were all over several hills. They were all Bailey's Crossroads. They were all over Munson Hill. They were all over. And they would set up uh, 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 earthworks earth, uh, like this on the top of the hill. Lowe would take up men. And of course, they would sketch where the men were, where the, where the pickets were, where the guns were, and guns and placements. The roads then were sketched. And the topographical engineers just really loved it because most of the Union Army didn't know about the roads in Virginia. You know, that, 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 that needed to be known before you could take an army anywhere. And, and it's during this time that the Confederates decided, we're tired of this balloon stuff. So we got to try to knock them down. And so they started a, a lot of the artillery firing on, on Lowe's balloons occurred. And Lowe learned quickly that he needed to, to protect his balloon not only as a station, so on the ground he would find either a ravine or a, 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 an area where there were a lot of trees, and there weren't a lot of trees left in these areas. Uh, so that would protect the balloon as it was, as it was being harbored. And then he needed to go up very quickly from above the treetops to about 300 feet before he then was above the artillery shells. And uh, so, so Lowe learned this very quickly, and they fired on him all the time. Now, Lowe would also take up with him two huge flags, U.S. flags, because he didn't want the U.S. troops firing on him either. Okay? And uh, his balloons were always brightly colored. And his philosophy is, if you can see me, I can see you. 
You know, and so he really put on the intimidation techniques uh, during this time period. So, uh, finally, now we get to July 21st, the Battle of Manassas. No balloons made it out there. Now, the topographical engineers not only employed Lowe, but they employed uh, another aeronaut. His name was John Wise. And Wise was really an aeronaut. I mean, he'd been an aeronaut for 30 years before the war. And uh, uh, Wise told the Army he could build a balloon cheaper than Lowe. And of course, they went to the lowest bidder. They built that balloon. It was called War Balloon. And, and, and Wise showed up to the gas works where Lowe actually was at the time, just before the battle started on the 21st and demanded he be that Lowe be removed from the gas works so he could top off his balloon and take it out into the field. Well, um, Thaddeus is also one of these that's a get even kind of guy, and he didn't like that, he didn't like that. He certainly did it. Uh, Wise filled these balloons, uh, the topographical, uh, topographical engineers uh, hooked it to a wagon, and off they went, and as they got out uh, towards the battlefield, they pushed the balloon through a set of trees on either side of the road and popped it. <laughs> and Wise, Wise tried to work with them, tried to have them do what he said, tried to do the right thing, tried to get the balloon out there, and was so frustrated, he quit. He said, I'm done with you. So this really made Lowe the number one go-to person. So no balloon really made it out. Uh, to, uh, to, Man to Manassas. And so uh, a couple days later on July 25th, Lincoln in frustration asks Lowe to come back to the White House. So Lowe returns to the White House. And, um, and so let me read to you what uh, 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 the account that Lowe uh, gives of this meeting. I received a message from the president asking me to spend the evening with him at the White House. I suspected that Professor Henry had related to him my difficulties. This was difficulties getting in to see Scott. Never did. A week and a half later, never got to see Scott. He had hoped that the letter of introduction uh, from his secretary that he gave me to General Scott would be so clear that, that the general would understand the president's desire in that matter and would be interested in my activities and in the creation of a department for aeronautics. But Lincoln was not willing to leave any stone unturned that might aid in crushing the rebellion. Now that's a nice insight, because that is certainly the case throughout Lincoln's entire career. The Union forces had suffered a complete rout at Bull Run only a few days before, and stragglers were coming in from the battlefield into Washington. The president was much perturbed and expressed the thought that if General McDowell had the information that only observations from a balloon could give, the result might have been different. We were seated at an old table in the president's workroom, and Lincoln said, Professor, I wish you would confer with General Scott once again. And he pulls out a card. And he writes on the card this note. Okay. Will Lieutenant General Scott please see Professor Lowe once more about his balloon, July 25, 1861, A. Lincoln. So with that, Lowe goes across the street to the War Department and tries three separate times that day to see Scott rebuff each and every time. So what was Scott up to? What was he doing that was so important? Well, he was laying out a general battle plan. That battle plan called the Anaconda Plan, what that was all about is having Union forces go down the Mississippi cut the Confederate in half, Confederacy in half, leaving Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana on one side. Also, also doing a blockade around the Atlantic, not allowing materials flowing back and forth. Now, little does Scott know 
low will actually play a small role in the anaconda plant. But um, what happens next is Lowe, who'd been invited to the White House for the evening, comes back at the end of the day and tells Lincoln, no go. Couldn't get in to see, see Scott. So uh, let me read you what happens next. Um, Lincoln immediately arose and said, come with me. <laughs> Goes over to the War Department. General Scott, who was seated, oh, bursts into their dining room. Scott was eating dinner at that time. And um, uh, went, went right by the aides that prevented Lowe from getting into the, to see Scott in the first place. So, so Lincoln, Lincoln certainly did that. So um, here's what happened in the dining room. General Scott, who was seated at the head of the table, uh, around which sat a number of military attaches of foreign governments, arose and saluted, as of course did all the others. None of whom, however, did the president seem to even notice, addressing himself solely to General Scott, saying something like to the effect, Professor Lowe had offered his services to this country and that he, the president, thought well of his aeronautic plans, to which General Scott <coughs> grudgingly replied, so did he. <laughs> and with that, and with that, Lowe became the chief aeronaut of the Union Army. Now, now he could do whatever he needed to to support the military. And he requested seven balloons to be built. This is the first one, the Union. Now these are uh, artists' recreations of the balloon. They're com they come from newspaper articles of, of, of what the descriptions of the balloons are. So there's something like this, but you can see they're brightly colored. Uh, big eagles, flags, can't mistake this is a Union balloon. Now this is 38 feet wide, 45 feet tall, 32,000 cubic feet of gas. So this is the top of the line military balloon. Could lift four cables with five men and at a price of $1,500, the Union. The next one he built, the very famous Intrepid. This one he used a lot. Uh, same class as the uh, Union balloon. Uh, however, on one side, he had an eagle uh, and a portrait of General McClellan painted on it. <laughs> so he also knew, he also knew a little bit about uh, uh, who, his, who his boss in the field was going to be. The next one, Constitution. Uh, along with the Liberty Statue that's sitting on top of the Capitol building at the moment. Freedom. 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 Now, yes, thank you. You're exactly right. And I knew as I said that, that was wrong. Another one in the United States. Uh, this one's smaller class, a little smaller. Uh, uh, also, uh, the Washington. This is one of the next smaller side. This is also an incredibly famous balloon. Low used this one a lot. Uh, George Washington on one side, his name on the other. Two men. Uh, still cost $1,000, $1,200 to build. The next one, the uh, Excelsior, nice eagle. This is a one-man balloon, something you get up right away. And another one, the Eagle. So those are the seven balloons that Lowe built. But he knew it wasn't just about protecting Washington, D.C. He knew he had to get out in the field, and so he invented gas generators. Now these were the most effective, effective and efficient gas generators ever built uh, at this time. Uh, he tried to patent them. He didn't get a patent, unfortunately. But these gas generators, what you would do is you would put iron filings in the gas, in the, in the generator rather. You'd use a dilute solution of sulfuric acid. And you'd a end up with what's called an exothermic reaction it would liberate hydrogen. And the hydrogen would come out and it would go through uh, these two areas. One's a scrubber, goes through some lime water, and then it, uh, it, it gets cooled and goes through a, 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 another element that does the scrubbing. So you cool the gas, and you scrub the gas, and then you stick it in the balloon. 
And here they are on the mall. And these are big affairs. They, they would sit, you could, they could just barely sit on, on, uh, four, on the, uh, on the uh, standard size uh, carriages. Uh, Low built 12 generators to support his balloons. The real big ones would use two generators and the smaller ones would use one. And he could deploy them in the field. All he needed was running water along with the, the, the materials such as the sulfuric acid and the, and the iron filings. And so here's, uh, here's a, an actual photo by uh, one of Brady's photographers in the field. Uh, there's Lowe uh, actually off to the side uh, touching his balloon. Uh, this is the fourth main, and he's got generators uh, number 11 and 12 with him. Inflation in the field was about three hours. So not only could he inflate in about three hours and get the balloon up right away, but that, that inflation would last him three weeks. So also down on the mall, we recreated some of, some of the, the exciting uh, activities that, we, that Lowe, Lowe did 150 years ago. He needed 30 men for these three lines. He learned very quickly with these balloons, which were double silked, uh, all, uh, with, uh, sewn in a way that uh, uh, kept them tight. He had a uh, very special varnish that he put on them. They could withstand enormous pressures from the wind. They were built to be tethered. They were built to be tethered balloons. Uh, that he really needed 30 men, 10 on each line, to move the balloons around, to deploy the balloon, tie it off, uh, or or uh, move it to any great distance. So uh, they always had he always had problems with this, but he always had a detail of men uh, uh, given to him to do it. Now the balloons were actually built in Philadelphia in uh, October, November, September, October, November time frame, 1861. And so he'd take the train back and forth. And on the train one day, he made this sketch. This sketch is of a boat towing a barge and a balloon launched off the barge. And he loved this idea and he pitched it uh, to McClellan, who also loved it, and got the okay to build it at the Navy Yard. And the Navy uh, at that time had acquired a schooner that went, um, uh, a, a steamer rather, a small steamer that went from uh, Arlington, zoned by the Lees, uh, over uh, back and forth uh, the market when they would uh, when they would um, uh, have crops that needed to be sold, and this was acquired for about 150 dollars. They were going to make a coal barge out of it. They were going to strip it super uh, structure, throw coal on it, and tow it out to the big ships that couldn't come up the Anacostia. And so Low saw that that seemed to be the perfect vehicle, and so they flat topped it. Uh, and it became the first aircraft carrier. Still maintained the name G.W. Park Custis or George Washington Park Custis. And he 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 would launch the, the Washington and the smaller balloons off of it. And so from this craft, he could be towed up and down the Potomac and and spot all kinds of things. And then of course relay that message either by dropping the information back down on the deck or through a telegraph. Now the telegraph wasn't used quite that often. Only in really a few great instances was it really valuable. But most of the time they would just drop messages down a guy wire that would go down, uh, weight, weighted down by a bullet, and uh, then those messages were passed on. So, Lowe kept Washington safe. He was an element of Lincoln's strategy. So what he did was place um, his balloons and aeronauts all up and down the Potomac, from Edwards Ferry, Clouds Mill, Poet Church, to Bud's Ferry. And these men, these were hired aeronauts, Seaver and Steiner and Purnell and LaMountain, and, and Lowe himself would go up, and Pollen, and even uh, he even hired his father to help him tow the slope. Now, late in, in, in March, uh, 1862, just before McClellan decides he's going to knock off Richmond by going down to Fortress Monroe and then up the peninsula, uh, Low moves a balloon, out, a balloon out to Fairfax Courthouse and makes some observations out there at that time. 
So let me just show you a couple period pictures of these. Of these. Now when Lowe's uh, basic lens ferry got going, Lowe would use a calcium light. This would be um, um, a, a limelight, calcium lime, would burn very bright, and, and um, uh, a, um, a professor Grant invented this many years earlier, and Lowe would take them up to the up with the balloons. Now that's really dangerous, really dangerous to hydrogen, but he got away with it, and he needed it because he could shine across the river, across the Potomac, to see what the Confederates were up to at night. Now Lowe's balloons would also go up at night because they would count the campfires, okay? Once he counted the campfires, knowing that there's about 10 men around the campfires, he could tell how many men were, they were opposed to. Now this part of the Potomac with the Virginia on the other side, uh, was very dangerous. In the back, the Confederates built a whole series of, of earthward fort, uh, forts up and down the Potomac and would not allow boats to go up. You really ran at, ran your risk. So they took Lincoln's blockade of the Atlantic to heart and blockaded the Potomac. And Lowe provided constant observations of where they were moving men, what they were doing, what was coming up and down the Potomac? Because his balloons were in constant observation uh, out of Bud's Ferry. Uh, here's one of the sketch, sketches that they did. And, and it gives you great insight because you can see some of the numbering. There's uh, letters and numbers uh, on, the, on the upper figures. And that was used to determine, in code, motions between point A and point B, what was growing, what was, what was uh, where the Confederate troops were now moving to in a very simple coded way. So, uh, uh, and these are beautiful, uh, beautiful sketches. That's also out of the National Archive record group, uh, 94, we were just talking about National Archive and how important that is to, to, uh, to history, and it is. Island number 10, all right, what is that? That is an island in the Mississippi, and it was a major blockade it, it stopped the Anaconda plan from working because the Union Army could not get by island number 10. Here's the island, right here. Here's, a, here's the Union held part of the Mississippi. And as you can see, this dog leg's pretty bad. And uh, one of the parts of the Anaconda plan is, of course, taking the Mississippi, splitting the Confederacy. And so they were having, they, they were there for months, couldn't get by island number 10. Confederate boats and, and the, whole, the whole running the gauntlet was just not going to work for them. So they uh, low sent a balloon out there with Steiner. Steiner, uh, uh, broken English, very German, hard to understand. They didn't, they didn't get it at first, wouldn't let him go up. And they built these huge flat topped gunboats with huge mortars and they would bring these boats down put the mortars here and then fire over this part of uh, the land to try to hit the island and then they couldn't get by the island and they couldn't figure it out finally they let Steiner go up he watched that and said you're missing the island by a couple hundred yards <laughs> they adjusted the shells and the island fell within a week after that. And so that broke, that broke the log jam, and then Steiner was sent back east. His job was done. And in the meantime, Lowe was mounting a campaign in support of, balloon campaign in support of uh, McClellan's push down to the peninsula. And so here it is. So uh, uh, McClellan was bringing down to Fortress Monroe 90,000 men. They were going to move up the peninsula and take Richmond. This side is York River. This side is the James River. And as uh, McClellan uh, landed, and actually he brought a low balloon down there first. Uh, a, a couple weeks earlier, a low balloon uh, came down to Fortress Monroe with Seaver. His job in the Constitution was to look for the Merrimack. 
if anything would stop the Union Army from embarking a huge number of men on Fortress Monroe, it would be easily the Merrimack. And so they were very worried about the Merrimack. Merrimack did not show up. McClellan got his men to Fortress Monroe. Lowe was with him, and they moved forward. They moved up to Yorktown. And at Yorktown, at Yorktown, which is right there, uh, the balloon station was right here. Uh, Lowe could observe what was going on, the firing back and forth and the movement. And in fact, in many ways, he could tell a lot about uh, what guns were facing what direction. Now, this is a sketch uh, by one of the fabulous artists. I think it's Lumley. Um, uh, where you can see Fortress Monroe, and you can see the, the, uh, the um, uh, York River that's lying along the side. Now, from this balloon, early in the morning, on May 4th, it was observed that the Confederate Army was leaving the fort. The reason why they were leaving the fort is McClellan had spent about a month bringing up all his heavy artillery to, to completely level Yorktown. And they were about ready to initiate that. The Confederates knew it. They had to leave and fall back. Lowe watched them leave. The alarm was on. And the chase up the peninsula went off. Now, what Lowe was told to do is put your balloons on the GW Park Custis and go up with the ex expedition that was going up the York River. This is uh, uh, the Franklin Expedition. Lowe was being towed by the rotary there. That's, uh, that's a uh, contract vehicle. It wasn't a military one. And up the York River they went. And there, there, there's one of the balloons that's Washington, actually, on uh, the GW Park Custis. That's also a period sketch, of course. Uh, this is, too. Uh, they embarked at the upper part of the York River. Uh, uh, this is uh, the White House, the Confederate White House. It's in the Washington family. Uh, and uh, Lowe from there followed the, the front lines right, right at the front of that movement towards Richmond. And he set up a series of balloons. Here's the first one, also a period sketch. That mechanics. <coughs> you can see Richmond. You can see people going to church. You can see the troops leaving the front. You can see the wounded coming back. You could see everything that was going on in the town. It was in all the papers. It's in all the diaries. All they had to do was look up, and there were balloons watching them. This one, the Constitution ended up at Mechanicsville. And Lowe takes uh, the Intrepid and um, uh, the Excelsior with him uh, to the Gainesville Farm. Now in May, a major battle occurred called the Battle of Fair Oaks. And in that battle, two balloons watched it. Lowe and the Intrepid, uh, he actually was at McClellan's headquarters at uh, uh, a place called the Trent House, the Trent family, uh, one of the uh, balloons at the Mechanicsville, and a Confederate balloon. It was launched by the Confederates, built in Petersburg, brought to Richmond, filled at the gas works at Richmond, put on a rail car, ran down the peninsula. And uh, General Alexander Porter, one of uh, Lee's trusted artillery um, heads, uh, actually was in that balloon. And uh, so three balloons watched this battle. But what's particularly important about this battle is Lowe had with him a telegraph operator. That telegraph operator would, uh, uh, Lowe would dictate what was going on, go down to McClellan's headquarters. That was also connected to the Washington Wire Service. Lincoln was across the street uh, in the telegraph office listening to the battle real time as it was occurring 120 miles away. All right? That was the technologies and the things that Lincoln liked and how they were implemented with the aid of the balloons and the telegraphs working together. Well, a series of battles that occurred um, at uh, Fair Oaks, um, Johnston was uh, uh, hurt, Lee took over, and the war 
changed the next day. A series of battles occurred, uh, the first one at Mechanicsville. And in fact, um, uh, Allen in the Mechanicsville balloon watched the Confederate Army come at him and he decided he has to get out of this balloon and he was a fabulous aeronaut. One, uh, uh, Lo had just hired him to come on board. He jumps out of the basket and slides down the guy wire. <laughs> they were that close and then brought down the balloon. The newspapers in the South went wild. They thought they'd shot down a balloon and killed an aeronaut, but they got the balloon out of there. That was on the 26th of June. The next day on the 27th, and here's the Gaines Mill farm, Here's the Gaines Mill, but the farm actually is down in this area. They were rushing to get that balloon station out of there. And in fact, here's the farm. Low is in a nice ravine. This picture actually occurred several weeks earlier to this battle. There's Low with, the, with one of his balloons. And they were filling it up in the ravine, and then they could go up and look. And literally, the Confederate Army was coming this way. They packed the balloon and left. They took some of the key elements out of the scrubbers and, and, and buried them so they wouldn't get caught. But they had to leave the gas generators behind. And Generator 12 and Generator 11 was left on the field as the Confederate Army swept by. So here's where the gas works were in, at Poe White Creek, and once again, they need flowing water to generate gas. And the men flew through this area, and there's the Gaines, Gaines Mill battlefield right over here. And um, uh, Williams is 9th Alabama. These guys right here walk right by the gas generators, and it's in their diaries, and it's in their letters. And the Confederates picked them up, and they put them on display in this square at Richmond. Now, Lowe was very embarrassed by that. Never told anyone. <laughs> Never told anyone. But as soon as he got back to Washington, D.C., he actually had two more made to replace him. And, and he kept dodging the bill, because no one authorized it. <laughs> he did. Got away with it. Now, it turns out um, the Civil War Trust has blocked this property uh, that extends the National Park Service Gaines Mill Battlefield. So here's the battlefield right here. Here's where the balloons were stationed. Their property cuts this area right in half. And so right now, that is a preserved property that will be turned over, purchased and turned over to the National Park Service. The Park Service is planning to, to make this a, a very nice area to visit. Uh, there's also a move afoot this summer to build a replica of the Intrepid. And in June of this, of this year, exactly when this occurred, the end of, the end of June, they're going to fly the Intrepid pretty close to where uh, Lowe's uh, uh, balloons were, uh, the Intrepid was, on this, on this battlefield. Uh, and uh, it's really, quite, uh, really a, a, quite an event. And so if you'd like, uh, please, uh, please uh, put that on your calendar. In late June, I can always tell you more about it. Well, McClellan lost those battles because he left the battlefield. And he continued to do so as he moved across the peninsula from the York River to the James. So he ends up at Berkeley Plantation, a place called Harrison's Landing, which is where uh, uh, vessels would come and go. And he would have the balloons up and down all the time, looking up and down the, the James River and looking for where the Confederates were and what they were going to do. Now, Lowe had gotten malaria by this time. <coughs> he was so sick, they had to send him home. And so James Allen was running this activity. And so uh, uh, McClellan, uh, late July, early August, decides he's got to leave and go back home. Uh, actually, Lincoln is forcing him to do this because he's not moving towards Richmond. He's moving away from Richmond, so he might as well come home. Uh, and that's what happens. But you've got to figure out, have you got a way out? And the only way they could do that was combine the Navy and the Air Force here. And so from these vessels, Lowe's, Lowe's, one of Lowe's balloons was towed uh, with the GW Park Customs down the James, down the James River with Allen in it, 
spotting where the Confederates were, they got down to a really big fort called Fort Powhatan, and they bombarded the heck out of it. Turns out there were not many Confederates there. They left, and then McClellan was given the all clear to bring men out, out of uh, uh, the Richmond area, out, out of Harrison's Landing, down, uh, down the uh, James River. And that was very successful for the balloons to make those observations. For McClellan, that, you know, that was unfortunate he didn't follow through. So here's just the overall uh, part of the Peninsula Campaign. A lot of battles, a lot of balloon flights. In fact, uh, during most of the war, uh, Lowe had well over 3,000 flights. Now I'm only going to talk about a couple more battles. One is uh, uh, Fredericksburg, across the river. Uh, Fredericksburg, the Rappahannock, is uh, the Phillips Plantation. Here's a period sketch, and you can see the low balloon. There's a nice little stream that runs through, so he's got his gas generators here. He's got the balloon here, and he had balloons up at Fredericksburg, watching the horrible battle that was going on there. Of course, this is what they were seeing, the Union Army charging the Confederates that were uh, in the sunken road. 12,000 Union men were casualties in that field, and only 900 casualties in the Confederate Army. And it was really quite a, quite a, quite a view, apparently. Um, several, several men that went up wrote about it in their diaries and letters. Uh, Lowe was also at the Battle of uh, Chancellorsville. This is now Hooker's in command. Uh, McClellan is out. Should have mentioned Burnside was the one that did the catastrophe at uh, Fredericksburg. And Lowe had three balloon stations up. Now he tried to convince, tried to convince Hooker several months before this to allow him to use flags for communication. He had a whole system of flags that he wanted to just drop off the, the the basket of the balloon that you could see them anywhere. But Hooker said, no, I don't want that. That would have worked wonderfully here because the three balloons were very far from the central location and they observed when the Confederates backed out of Fredericksburg, this was Early's men, when Early's men left, the balloon said go and, and Sedgwick and his men uh, came across. Um, Hooker, Hooker ended up getting clobbered because Lee also split his army by Jackson going around uh, and then uh, the frontal assaults that they made. And a lot of that was observed from the balloons, but they couldn't get the information to, uh, to Hooker in time. All right, so what happened? Soon after Chancellorsville, Lowe had had enough. Uh, he was being scrutinized by the IG. He's a contractor. He never became a civil servant. He wanted to be a civil servant because he knew if he was captured, he'd be killed unless he was in the service. Uh, also, um, um, pay, his pay was cut, and he was very disgruntled. So he left, and Allen had to, had to, uh, had to uh, continue on. And at the end of the Battle of Chancellorsville, the quartermaster department came in and moved his gas generators, all these balloons, lock, stock, and barrel, and brought them back to Washington, D.C. Now, instead of putting them in the armory, which is what they typically did, because Lowe wasn't there to smooth the things over and make things happen all the time. They stuck them in one of the government warehouses. Now, I don't know what a government warehouse looks like other than the one that was in Indiana Jones and the Raiders of Ars. So it's got to be what it looked like. There were like four or five of them in Washington, D.C. And the balloons were stored there. And no general called the balloons out. There wasn't the charisma like Lowe had to be able to convince them, hey, this is what we need to do, and here's where I fit in. And the Allen uh, actually also had his brother. The Allen brothers just um, waited to be called and never were. The balloon sat in the store, storage area for a year until one of the clerks who wanted the space wrote a letter to his supervisor saying, I think these balloons are sitting in here rotting. Okay, that's what he said. Supervisor got all upset. Here's all this money we devoted to the balloon corps, and they're rotting. We better sell them. Within two weeks, they were on the auction block, and they sold them. And so here's what happened. Uh, an ad went out in April, 1864, sell all the balloons, all the fixtures, all the seven balloons, everything. And it, and it was uh, 
the auction site is at uh, Rollins Park, uh, right there in uh, right there in red. Now Lowe came down and bought one, perhaps two balloons. He bought the Washington for sure. He may have bought the United States, but after from here on, he would use these balloons at uh, various events. Come, come for 50 cents. You can ride the Washington War Balloon and do this and do that. And he made money off of this for years afterwards. So, what can we say then about Lincoln and Lowe? Well, it was really Lincoln, as you can see, that made this happen. And what did he, what did he, ha what did he make happen? Well, Lowe uh, observed the movements of the Confederate Army. Could you? Not 50 miles, that he, you know, he brags a lot too. So when he's message where he says, I can see 50 miles, he, he couldn't see 50 miles, 15 miles maybe. But 15 miles is a day march for any army. So with low, early on, if they could see 15 miles, then that means if an army is coming, Washington had a day to prepare, and that's really what they wanted. That fit Lincoln's strategy. So low is part of keeping Washington safe. Like the forts, which were the physical reminder of we can, we can uh, push back the Confederates, the visual reminder of I can see them coming really helped significantly. They made extensive maps of all the areas, not only in the, in the Virginia area, but down on the peninsula and, and, and all around, and those were incredibly important. Artillery spotting. Every time they did artillery spotting, it worked perfectly. It worked perfectly. They just didn't use it very often, for whatever reason. Uh, Low allowed all kinds of officers up. Officers would look, uh, understand the terrain better, and actually operate on that. That became actionable intelligence, which is very important. And uh, that continued on for, for, the, for the whole life of the balloon corps. So the big question is, could the balloons have really hastened the end of the war? Well, the way they were being used and the way Lowe wanted to use them were two different things. The military intelligence that, that uh, where this information was coming in was not able to assimilate that and operate on it. They had difficulties with that. And where the balloons could have been most important, the balloon corps was disbanded. And what I'm talking about are the trench warfare that occurred for nine months around Petersburg. From a balloon, you could see where the weak points were, where the Confederates were moving, and you could have easily <laughs> broken that at, any, at, at, at many times, I'm sure. So they could have been significant. They weren't. Uh, they did a number of nice things. But as, uh, but as uh, Ben Franklin once said, when he first observed a balloon, and, and one, of, uh, one of the men that uh, uh, also saw that said, well, what good use are they? He said, well, what good use is a baby? It just took time to be able to mature the technology. Lowe did that, but didn't have the opportunity to have it come to full fruition. Thank you very much. are only good for three hours of parking, so anyone that needs to leave, please go ahead and do so. Uh, I think we have time for maybe two questions. Well, I'll take questions. Uh, yes. The uh, Philadelphia Inquirer maintained a bureau in Washington, a regular column. It's nice to meet you. June 20, 1961, there were several reports.